A roller coaster is an example where one is exchanging back and forth between potential energy at the top of a ramp and kinetic energy when the cart in a roller coaster comes down toward the bottom. Some roller coasters have a looped loop in them, and amazingly, nothing is done to make the cart stick on the track other than we have to go around the loop really fast before we fall off. We can understand this process actually using conservation of energy. At the bottom of the loop, we'll have a velocity v bottom, which we didn't have before at the very top of the whole ramp. Up here, our velocity was zero, but we had lots of potential energy. At the very bottom, we have lots of kinetic energy created out of that potential energy at the top. As we go through the loop the loop, we have a different speed, v top, at the top of the loop. In other words, we slow down a little bit because we exchange some of that potential energy, some of that kinetic energy for the higher potential energy at the top of the arc. We know that the top of the loop is the crucial moment. If we're going to fall off the track, that's the place where it's going to happen. And it happens if we don't move quickly enough through the top of the loop. The question now that we'll address is how quickly we have to be going in order to stay on the track at the top of the loop. We do Newton's laws here, and we're going to get a little bit of help from doing conservation of energy at various times. So Newton's law is calling us to write down a free body diagram for the cart, the roller coaster cart, at the top of the arc. There are two forces acting on the car, gravity, which is pushing straight down, and the normal force from the track, which is also pushing straight down when we're at the top of the arc. If we write down Newton's second law, then we must have minus mg minus n equals minus mv squared over r. In this case, we're writing down v top squared because we're, it's at this moment that we have our velocity equals v top. r is the radius of the loop. Now when will we fall off? We fall off when there is no normal force pushing on a, the bottom of the wheel, wheels of the cart. When we set n equals zero, that's equivalent to the condition where we're about to fall off the tracks. In this case, we have an expression for what v top is. v top squared equals g times r. How does that help us? We need to make a connection between how high off the ground we started at the top of this ramp and what will be the velocity at the top of the loop. To do this, we use conservation of energy. At the bottom of the loop, we have a kinetic energy at the bottom plus the potential energy at the bottom, which has to equal in sum the initial kinetic energy and the initial potential when we're over here at the top of the ramp. At the top of the ramp, we have no kinetic energy if we start out from rest, and we have a potential energy, mgh. At the bottom of the loop, we have no potential, but we have a kinetic energy, one half mv bottom squared. This allows us to calculate that v bottom is the square root of 2 times g times the height, another familiar result. But this is not yet the same as needing to calculate the velocity at the top of the loop, where the normal force might be as small as 0. At the top of the loop, we can again write down conservation of energy and say that initial kinetic plus potential equals the kinetic plus potential at the top of the loop right there. At the top of the ramp, our, we only have potential energy, mgh. At the top of the loop, we hopefully have some kinetic energy, 1 half mv top squared. But now we also have some potential energy, because instead of being down here at the very bottom, we've climbed back up a distance. And how far is that distance? It's 2r. So our potential energy here at this location is mg times 2r. Or v top squared equals 2g h minus 2r. If we insert an expression for what v top must be in order to keep a normal force acting on the cart, we find that v top squared is rg, and we set that equal to 2g h minus 2r. We wanted to know initially 
how high of a ramp do we need to send this roller coaster down? And we find that 5r equals 2h, or h is 5 halves r. In other words, if you see a roller coaster with a loop-de-loop -loop on it, and it's not starting out at some very high value, higher than 2.5r, then you should probably not get on that ride. So to recap, when you start from a site certain height h, the critical criteria for whether or not you're going to make it around a loop-de-loop -loop is that the velocity at the bottom has to equal 5gr or more, and the velocity at the top has to equal the square root of gr or more. Now let's actually see the experiment. Welcome back. Right, I'm really excited about this next item because it's the biggest and bestest thing fifth gear has ever done. Hell yeah, check this out. Who remembers these? Hot wheels and loop-de-loop. -loop. Come on, Tom, send one down. Here we go. Yes, but what we wanted to know is could you do that in a real-life family-sized car? Yeah, we gave the job to our friendly neighborhood stuntman, Steve Trulia, but we wanted some questions answering first. How fast would he have to go? Would the car stick to the road? And would he black out under the G-forces? Steve Trulia is the man facing this monster challenge. As fifth gear's head of danger, he's rolled, crashed, and crashed again in numerous fifth gear stunts. But even by these extreme standards, nothing can prepare him for our most dangerous stunt yet. Clearly, scaling a toy up to a record-breaking 40 feet high using five tons of steel and a real-life motor was going to be dangerous. So we sent Steve to Cambridge University's Dr. Hugh Hunt to find out how fast he'd have to go. Now listen carefully. Two R uh, plus a half V in squared Starting to cook my brain a bit now. 36, About miles, 36 per hour. miles an hour. But you know what we haven't worked out though? What's that? Is we, what are the G forces you're going to experience? Because you want to know whether you're going to black out or not. The total G force you will experience as you enter this loop will be 6 G. It gives me a bit more confidence because of the science, but at the end of the day, I don't know if that's going to count when I'm staring at the track with my foot in the accelerator. chances of Steve blacking out of the wheel, he needed to get used to pulling 6G. The only place to do that was in this. And here we go into the loop. out if you really can drive a car around a 40-foot high loop-the-loop. -loop. If successful, stuntman Steve Trulia will set a new world record. If he fails and falls out of the loop, the massive deceleration forces as he hits the ground could be fatal. The entry speed is therefore literally a matter of life or death, so Steve verified the car's speedo with GPS 36, 37. and then checked again with a calibrated radar gun. 36 miles an hour had been calculated as the ideal entry speed. Slower than this, and he'd fall. Much faster, and the G-forces would knock him unconscious and exert a dangerous force on the ramp's structure. The Toyota Igo Steve had chosen for the stunt had been heavily modified to make it strong enough and hopefully safe enough should things go wrong. Here we go. Let's do it. This is it. We're going in too fast. so light on the top, I really thought I'd lost it. I felt weightless, I thought I'm falling. I'm so glad that's very touching the road all the way around. 
as soon as I left the lab, just complete feeling of joy and elation. Dr. Hugh Hunt's analysis revealed how close we'd come to disaster. Just 2.5 miles an hour slower, and Steve would have fallen. And here we go. One mile an hour faster, and the extra friction caused by the scraping would have made him fall as well. Steve hit it spot on, so take a moment to savour the world record for driving a car around the largest loop the loop. Chances are, you'll never see it executed so perfectly ever again. The movie cites some values that I want to check just to make sure that we did our math correctly too. The movie states that the driver needs to be going at about 36 miles per hour at the bottom of the loop in order to make it all the way around the top using conservation of energy. Well this is actually about right. If the diameter of the track was approximately 40 feet then this translates to a radius of curvature of about 6 meters. And if you recall, that the, we were derived that the velocity at the bottom of the loop had to equal the square root of 5 g r. If we use 6 meters for r, then this results in a velocity at the bottom of about 17.3 meters per second, or about 39 miles per hour. The other statement is that the driver will be pulling about 6 g's in acceleration. This is also a true statement. If we think again about a free body diagram, and at the very bottom of the loop, there's gravity pulling downward, the normal force pushing up, and the com combination of these two have to break for a centripetal force. We know that minus mg plus the, the normal force has to equal plus mv squared over r. A, will, the acceleration, will point back toward the center of the circle, and therefore at n, the normal force has to point back toward the center of the circle. This gives that the normal force equals 6 mg because we derive an expression for what the velocity has to be, and that's 5 gr. <laughs>